Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, again, I'd like, to, you know, I'd like to congratulate you on the wise choice of a bus because you made it on the uh, buses that actually made it here. Uh, you, you just made the right choice this morning. Um, I hope the bus ride was okay, not too long. Um, well, the chair of the of this session didn't make make it on the right bus, so the, so you have to. I have to do. <laughs> you have to do uh, without her. So I'm I'm just replacing her. Uh, but uh, it's my pleasure to have Elliot Oring here as today's keynote, a fellow folklorist. Uh, yes, <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Emeritus of Anthropology uh, at uh, California State uh, University, Los Angeles. Um, and uh, uh, well, his, his talk is going to be about the general theory of verbal humor, commenting on it, uh, improving it. So without much further ado, I will give the floor to Elliot so that he can take his time to explain what's wrong with it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> you can hear me, yes, okay. The general theory of verbal humor was first proposed by Salvatore Attardo and Victor Raskin in 1991. It was an elaboration of the semantic script theory of humor published six, year before, six years before by Raskin with additional thoughts by Atardo on the different levels of abstraction that might be identified in a joke. Some questions were raised about the theory when it was first proposed as to whether without transformational rules it could generate jokes and only jokes, and whether it could really handle funny rhymes, excessive alliterations, or spoonerisms. But these, were for, for the most part, did not upset the promulgation and the wide adoption of the theory, both within and outside of linguistics. In any event, the general theory of verbal humor was claimed to be a theory of humor competence, not humor production. It was meant to be a description that could differentiate between what a native speaker would regard as a joke-carrying text and a non-joke-carrying text, in the same way that a grammar might predict what a native speaker would regard as a grammatical and ungrammatical utterance. More serious and sustained criticisms of the general theory were raised by Graham Ritchie in 2004. In 2011, I questioned the hierarchy of knowledge resources posited by the general theory, the reported experimental confirmation of this hierarchy, as well as the degree of faithfulness of the general theory's model of jokes to the close analysis of specific texts. Here I would like to reprise and extend some of the basic concerns about the general theory of verbal humor and its predecessor, the semantic script theory of humor, and their implication for subsequent theorizing. The main hypothesis of semantic script theory on which the general theory is based is that a text can be characterized as a joke-carrying text if one, the text is compatible or fully or in part with two different scripts, two, the two scripts with which the text is compatible are opposite in a special sense defined. And I add a third here, the two scripts with which the text is compatible are said to overlap fully or in part, even though that's not formally a part of the statement in the semantic mechanisms of humor. In other words, the key terms in the theory are script, compatibility, oppositeness, and overlap. A script is a chunk of semantic information that surrounds a term and the concept it designates. Technically, a script is represented by a graph with lexical nodes and semantic links between the nodes, what in plain speak might be called a term and its web of associations. A humor-carrying text would be one that contains two opposite scripts. Opposite scripts can be those that negate the other or are antonyms of the other. 
But semantic script theory adds that the two scripts can be opposite in a local sense within a particular discourse. Thus, semantic script theory characterizes the oppositeness in the joke, he is a man of letters, he works for the post office, as he is a writer versus he is not a writer. In semantic script theory, it would seem that any script might be designate, designated as opposite to every other one simply by putting the word not in front of it. Except for a writer script, all other scripts are necessarily not writer scripts. Opposition is put forward by semantic script theory as a technical and operationalizable term, but I would argue it is no such thing. Semantic oppositions do exist. There may be gradable, directional, orthogonal, and antipodal opposites. There may be contradictories and contraries, but these are only a subset of the kinds of differences that appear in jokes. Difference is not the same thing as opposition. To make a joke dependent on a man of letters script, one must invoke a script that does not involve writing, but that does involve letters in some other literal or figurative way. Actually, there are a number of scripts that might serve beside Postman. He is a man of letters. He paints advertising billboards. He is a man of letters. He operates a linotype machine. He is a man of letters. He alphabetizes the card catalog in the library. He is a man of letters. He spices genes. Can a sign painter, a linotype operator, a librarian, a postman, and a microbiologist equally be considered oppositions to the com concept of writer? To suggest that they are local oppositions, that is, oppositions that only can be recognized in a particular stretch of discourse, does not, I believe, address the problem in what is put forward as a global theory of verbal humor. In fact, one of the problems with my own appropriate incongruity perspective is that incongruity and appropriateness can only be specified post hoc in particular local contexts. If a joke could be created using two scripts that in no sense could be categorized as opposite, would they automatically become opposite? If so, then it would seem that opposite has little theoretical value. It would be jokes that create oppositions rather than oppositions that create jokes. Actually, such a test has been performed in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll, in the course of the Mad Tea Party, the Mad Hatter asks a riddle, why is a raven like a writing desk? When Alice gives up and asks for the answer, the Mad Hatter says that he hasn't the slightest idea. Lewis Carroll did not intend this riddle to have a solution, but that did not stop Carroll enthusiasts, and later Carroll himself, under pressure from such enthusiasts, from proposing solutions. The best and most succinct, perhaps, is that a raven is like a writing disc because Poe wrote on both. So are we to say that in formulating this riddle answer that ravens and writing discs are brought into opposition? One might also ask what semantic script theory would make of the formulation, he is a man of letters but produces nothing of literary value. Here it might be argued there is script oppositeness in semantic script theory sense of the term, and that a man is declared to be a man of letters, a writer, but is not a genuine writer when reckoned in terms of the quality of his literary output. Indeed, semantic script theory might have difficulty distinguishing this sentence from a joke, as it could be said to contain both script oppositeness and script overlap. My appropriate incongruity perspective, however, would point out that the appropriateness of the man of letters who produces nothing of literary value is not spurious. Consequently, no humor is produced. A postal worker, sign painter, a linotype operator, only men of letters in a spurious sense, for none are belles lettrists. The writer who produces inferior pieces of writing is a man of letters, if only of an inferior sort. 
one could have a serious discussion as to what constitutes the level of literary merit that would qualify a writer as a man of letters. One could not have a similar discussion about a postal worker, sign painter, or linotype operator. The concept of oppositeness is not and has never been well defined. Different scripts are necessarily opposed to one another when the opposition of A is simply reckoned as anything that is not A. Under this conceptualization, a daffodil is the opposite of a carburetor, a raven is the opposite of a writing desk, a linguist is perhaps the opposite of a snake oil salesman. <laughs> although, linguists have, although linguistics has successfully harnessed plus minus notation in discriminating phonemes and lexemes in componential descriptions, it does not seem useful in characterizing the scripts in a broad range of jokes. Consequently, oppositeness in semantic script theory should be characterized as some computational linguists have characterized it merely as incongruence. For a text to be a humor-carrying one according to semantic script theory, the opposed scripts need to be in some sense fully or in part compatible. The only type of compatibility proposed by semantic script theory is script overlap. That is, different scripts share similar components. Overlap is never precisely defined in semantic script theory. Rather, it is illustrated. Is the doctor at home, I'm sorry to do this, the patient asked in his bronchial whisper? No, the doctor's young and pretty wife whispered in reply, come right in. Semantic script theory identifies an initial medical script that is characterized by an individual with symptoms of illness, a bronchial whisper, seeking entrance to the home office of a physician. Surprisingly, the doctor's wife declares that the doctor is not at home, yet invites the patient in. Equally curious is that the invitation, like the inquiry of the patient, is delivered in a whisper. These odd states of affair, an incongruity according to my own perspective, initiate a search for a second script which is compatible with the first and in which the wife's whispering and invitation makes some kind of sense. The characterization of the doctor's wife as young and pretty, which would seem irrelevant to the medical script, eases the recognition of a lover script which is compatible with the wife's whispered invitation to the patient to enter the house while the doctor is away. In other words, the overlap between the patient and lover scripts, according to semantic script theory, generates the joke-carrying text. Given the description I have just offered, I would argue that the main hypothesis of semantic script theory fails to identify the necessary and sufficient conditions for joke-carrying texts. What is absent from the main hypothesis is, that the, is the notion that the reader or hearer of a verbal joke encounters some kind of incongruity that precipitates the search for an alternative script that makes sense of that incongruity. In my terms, that it makes the incongruity appropriate. The semantic script theory recognizes the existence of such incongruity creating devices, but characterizes them as something that are found in many, but not all, jokes. Because it has not included the notion of contradiction, or rather incongruity, in the main hypothesis, the main hypothesis is deficient in defining a joke-carrying text. This text is from Raskin's Semantic Mechanisms of Humor. A funny thing happened to a friend of mine. He had bronchitis and went to see his doctor. The doctor's wife, who was young and pretty, opened the door. He asked whether the doctor was in and naturally had to whisper because he had lost his voice. The woman misunderstood him entirely and decided that he was whispering because he did not want to be overheard. She thought, therefore, that he had amorous designs on her and happily whispered an invitation to come in because, of course, her house, spouse was a, conveniently away and the two of them were alone. The above text is offered by Victor Raskin as a botched version of the patient-lover joke. But it is not botched, nor does it suffer from a surfeit of detail, as he suggested. 
The text contains both patient and lover scripts, as well as an overlap between the two scripts in the whispering of the characters. This text takes the form of a schwank or a comic tale. What it lacks is a punchline which triggers a sudden reconceptualization of the relevant scripts. But there is no punchline in the above text. But if there is no punchline in the above text, the concept of the punchline is absent from the main hypothesis of semantic script theory as well. There is no mention of punchlines, only script opposition and script overlap. Had the main hypothesis confronted the notion of a punchline, it would necessarily have been brought to an encounter with incongruity as a necessary condition of joke-carrying texts. A covert compatible script suddenly discovered in a text is what makes an incongruity in a joke appropriate and qualifies a, joke for, uh, a text for joke status. It is not that comic tales are devoid of humor. They are simply not jokes. The comic tale invariably reveals too much and hides too little. There is no forced reinterpretation of the text. The matter of script opposition and overlap become more complicated in some jokes than might be supposed by the analysis of the patient-lover joke, which all too many researchers have taken as the standard model. For example, a man who has taken to drink supported himself by tutoring in a small town. His vice eventually became known, however, and as a result, he lost most of his pupils. A friend was commissioned to urge him to mend his ways. Look, you could get the best tutoring in the town if only you would give up drinking, so do give it up. Who do you think you are, was the indignant reply. I do tutoring so that I can drink. Am I to give up drinking so I can get tutoring? First, let us identify the possible scripts in this joke. There is tutoring, a type of work. There is the drinking of alcohol. There is the friend or friendship script who is instructed to perform what today in the United States would be called an intervention to persuade the man to curtail his drinking. These are the scripts that are easily retrievable from the surface of the joke text. But nothing in this joke depends on a simple semantic overlap of any of these scripts. No elements of the tutoring script are shared with the drinking script. A friendship script might overlap with a drinking script. Friends often drink together. And a friendship script might overlap with a tutoring script, where a friend to tutor a friend. But it is clear that these kinds of overlaps cannot be recognized as the source of this joke. This, this joke, however, produces an incongruity at the point the friend attempts to intervene and alter the drinker's behavior. The drinker is indignant. This is in itself not incongruous, as many alcoholics resent the attempts of friends and relations to alter their behaviors. It is the drinker's justification of his indignation that generates the text's humor. Those listening to or reading the joke recognize, along with the character of the friend, that drinking is a serious problem, one that is impairing the drinker's ability to secure a livelihood. The incongruity in the joke is that drinking is not viewed by the drinker as a problem, even though it results, results in the loss of some work. The punchline reveals this incongruity to be an appropriate one. From the drinker's perspective, the tutoring work is valued solely as a means by which to secure money for drink. In other words, the joke hinges on a reversal of the direction of presumed cause and effect. One presumes that drink is a problem because it hampers the ability to secure work. The other presumes that work is solely an activity that enables the worker to secure drink. In order to cast this joke into semantic script theory's categories of opposition and overlap, one would have to describe a script opposition between drinking and tutoring or drinking and working more generally. But these scripts do not overlap in any of their components, as in the patient-lover joke. The faulty reasoning is detectable without being immediately specifiable. The fact that the customer did not pay for the cake is disguised by the statement that he hadn't eaten it. If the exact nature of the fraud could be instantly specified, the joke would tend to disappear, as it did in my reformulation of it. Faulty reasoning alone will not create a joke, however. 
A guy goes into a flower shop and orders a bouquet of roses, which he plans to send to a woman who has recently broken up with him because she has become attracted to another man. He tells the shop owner that he wants roses, some of which will quickly fade, to suggest to her the impermanence of her new attachment. The shop owner tells him roses are flowers, and some flowers quickly fade. So don't worry, some of these roses will quickly fade. We need some logicians here to see the fallacy in that, perhaps. If you are troubled by the fact that this text does not seem to rise to joke-carrying status, despite its obvious reliance on a mechanism of faulty reasoning, then you and I are together in run wondering what the exact relationship of the faulty logic mechanism is to the creation of jokes. Many of the mechanisms listed above are also characteristic of non-humorous texts and discourse. Certainly, they are not all paralogical or spurious by definition. Inference of consequences, coincidence, proportion, parale parallelism, analogy, and chiasmus do not inevitably or even usually produce humor. Even the use of faulty reasoning, which is by definition paralogical, does not, as we have seen in the above text, automatically create a humorous scenario. People propose illogical arguments all the time and are roundly criticized for them or otherwise ignored. It's not difficult to identify some otherwise obvious mechanisms that seem to escape the list above. An incongruity can be made appropriate when an object, situation, or person is viewed from a different perspective. Son, I think it's time we talked about sex. Sure, Dad, what do you want to know? <laughs> At first, this joke may look like role exchange, a mechanism that is included in the list I showed you. The son seems to be taking on the role of the father and that he will instruct the father in sexual matters. But that is not really what is happening. The son has not approached his father in order to instruct him about sex, which might suggest role exchange. The joke rather depends on the change in perspective as to which of the two joke characters likely possesses more information about or more experience with sex. The initial assumption is that the parent would. The punchline suggests to the listener that it is the son who might. Such changes in perspective have been called the Rashomon effect after Akira Kurosawa's film, in which conflicting stories of a crime are told from the perspective of its various characters. It is worth returning to the example of the joke about the great Barzini and his act involving being hit in the head with a sledgehammer. Recall that there is no overlap between the performance and hospital scripts. Rather, an element from the performance script, the exclamation, ta-da, is attached to the very end of the hospital script. If we peruse the list of logical mechanisms, we might discover the term juxtaposition and be satisfied that we had identified the logical operator in this joke. I believe, however, we would be wrong. Juxtaposition is more likely to create incongruities than resolve them. In the Barzini joke, juxtaposition creates the anomaly. Why would Barzini employ an expression of triumph when his performance has proved such an utter failure? When the joke is considered in terms of the, Barz the Rashomon effect, however, we can see the appropriateness of Barzini's gesture. From the perspective of the medical staff and the joke listener, Barzini has been unconscious for 10 years. There is no basis for his belated expression of triumph. From Barzini's expression, however, those 10 years of hospitalization do not exist. His consciousness extends directly from the instant before the hammer hit him in the head to the moment his eyes popped open in the hospital. For him, there is no interruption. His performance is of a piece, and consequently, his triumphant flourish is completely appropriate. The Rashomon effect is what is operating in this joke. Humor studies has been living with the semantic script theory of humor and the general theory of verbal humor for some 30 years. For nearly 20 years, humor scholars have been tantalized with the promise of a computer-based implementation of these theories. And the ontological semantics theory of humor has been put forward as the fulfillment of these promises. 
A computer-based program of humor generation and comprehension depends upon ontologies, semantically structured encyclopedias of linguistic and cultural knowledge. Ontologies are essential for natural language processing, are not in themselves peculiar to the processing of humor. But humor processing requires some additional knowledge in terms of the recognition of what have been regarded as semantic incongruities, ambiguities, oppositions, appropriateness, resolutions, or compatibilities. At present, I'm skeptical about the prospects for an ontological semantics of humor for several reasons. First, the ontological semantics theory of humor is based on semantic script theory and the general theory of verbal humor and continues to employ the terminology of script opposition and script overlap and knowledge resources, notions which are pr problematic and which are at best op uh, applicable to only a subset of jokes. Two, the ontological semantics theory of humor depends on notions of logical mechanism from the general theory of verbal humor and is likely to be flawed because of incompleteness in the identification of logical mechanisms and the absence of precise definitions of those mechanisms that have purportedly been identified. Often the means by which incongruities are made appropriate in jokes escape these mechanical specifications altogether, such as the example of the Duke of Wellington's words. Three, despite the explicit or low belated recognition by proponents of semantic script theory and the general theory of verbal humor that they are rooted in uh, incongruity theories, semantic script theory and the general theory of verbal humor have failed to oper operationalize and incorporate notions of incongruity and appropriateness. Script opposition, as it has been described, is not the same as incongruity. Numerous texts might revolve around oppositions that are in no ways humorous, and there are jokes which do not seem to easily lend themselves to analysis in, ter in oppositional terms. My approach to the study of jokes has been from the point of view of appropriate incongruity. I am fortunately a folklorist, and my concerns have been to understand how contents are structured within the text of a joke and in joke corpuses, in an effort to see what a joke might mean in social, situational, or broader cultural contexts. Appropriate incongruity seems sufficient for this task. An appropriate incongruity perspective has also been extremely useful in assessing whether the analyses of jokes proposed by others seem accurate and persuasive. To date, I have found a number of joke an analyses by humor scholars which I believe are far off the mark. Consequently, an appropriate incongruity perspective has both analytical and critical force. I will happily confess that appropriate incongruity is a post hoc conceptualization with little or no predictive power. Why? Because I cannot at this time operationalize either the notion of incongruity or appropriateness. That's not to say they can't be operationalized or only that I have no idea currently how to do it. Graham Ritchie, after attempting formal descriptions of forced reinterpretation jokes in symbolic language, also concedes that his descriptions can lead to no algorithms or software implementations in the absence of precise definitions of, quote, inappropriateness and contrast. My sense of semantic script theory and the general theory of verbal humor is they are post hoc conceptualizations as well. Only after something is regarded as humorous do the underlying oppositions, overlaps, and mechanisms become visible. Ultimately, the point is not to argue or assert whether my concerns and criticisms have substance, although we could. The ontological semantics theory of humor has now set new terms for the debate. Consequently, the adequacy of their formulation should be demonstrated with the following test. Identify a joke domain. For example, doctor-patient jokes, teacher-student jokes, human martian jokes, whatever, so long as they are not formula jokes. This will restrict the breadth of whatever, whatever ontology might be necessary for the identification of such jokes. At this stage of the process, even I cannot expect that a semantic 
ontology would be adequate to identify each and every joke that might be thrown at it. I would leave it to the proponents of the ont ontological semantics theory to identify a joke domain, even if it were a fairly restricted one. Then a body of verbal texts of a specifiable and significant number should be submitted for identification by the computer program. These texts will be submitted by humor researchers not engaged in the ontological semantics project. I would be happy to contribute. These texts should include those that are identified as joke texts by human subjects, as well as texts constructed for the purpose of the experiment that are identified as not being joke texts by those same subjects. The corpus of text should be submitted to the computer program with the expectation that discriminations between joke and non-joke texts reasonably match those made by human subjects. The only restrictions on the ontological semantics theorists are one, the text submitted for analysis should be published, Two, the jokes submitted for the computer analysis and identification should not be changed in any way after receipt. Three, no changes can be made to the ontology or the computer program when those, once those same texts have been received. And four, there should be a specification of a time limit for the ontological semantic theorists to get their ontology and programs prepared for the experiment. I would wish to still be alive for the witness the results. If the experiment proves successful, then I will have more confidence that the semantic script theory and the general theory of verbal humor live up to their claims about how joke texts work, and that my concerns to date would seem to be unfounded. Until that time, my suspicions, my deep suspicions, remain. My concern about the ontological semantics theory of humor do not represent the worries of a humanist fearing that the computer recognition or production of humor, although production would seem easier, would constitute a final assault on the claims of the nobility and irreducibility of the human spirit, whatever that might mean. I am actually sanguine about the possibility of the computerization of humor. I believe that a computer with a sufficiently large, complex, and sophisticated ontology and rules for how to recognize incongruous categories and the spurious means by which those categories can be brought into some psychologically valid alignment might be possible. I cannot think of a reason that the knowledge and rules that I employ to produce and recognize jokes could not be successfully modeled and deployed by a machine. I am only suspicious that the semantic script theory of humor and the general theory of verbal humor are the platforms upon which such a computer model can be success successfully built. Thank you. Before you can identify a joke as derisive, I think you need to identify it as a joke. Uh, so you think all the jokes are derisive? Uh, there is a superiority theory. Well, it's interesting that uh, in your presentation, you never mentioned the superiority theory. I, 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 to be honest, I'm very much in favor in, of incongruity theory for reasons I've articulated in one of the other sessions. Incongruity theory is the only theory that is not a functional theory. It doesn't argue for a particular function that jokes serve. Superiority theory does. 
psychoanalytic theory does, a whole host of other theories start with the basis of what is this for. Incongruity does not start with the question, what is this for? It starts with the question, what is it? And it seems to me that is a superior approach. Once we know what it is, then we can begin to look at its function. And yes, humor does have many functions, but I don't think you're necessarily going to comprehend it in a unified theory by starting with the individual functions. I think you need to start with what is the thing itself. Yes, uh, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be trumpeting all of this if I didn't think they were essential. Now, um, the fact of the matter is, as I pointed out, I cannot operationalize the word incongruity. And if you can, I, and I don't know why people, linguists, aren't thinking about that harder. Um, and as far as I can tell, and I really don't understand a lot of the computational linguistic stuff that I see, but as far as I can tell, what they do is they throw words or concepts into vector spaces and then try and figure out how distant they are from one another. But that, that, to, me, that to me skirts the essential problem of what incongruity is. And what is appropriateness? What is, what is compatibility? You know, uh, as I say in, in my last book, what other than identity is appropriateness? And what other then identity is incong you know, other than incongru is incongruity. How do we define these things? The term, we understand them intuitively when we hear them. We recognize when things are incongruous. We recognize jokes when we see incongruities being brought into some kind of spurious relationship. But we can't, we can't seem to operationalize these things. And I think a little more thought, you know, maybe my Bergsonian friends um, believe it can't be done. But, but I believe that we should at least try. I'm all in favor of computational linguistics. I don't hate these people, um, <laughs> except as individuals, but as a class. <laughs> except, but as a class, as a class, I think they're doing worthwhile work. I think the kind of stuff they're doing, but I think they have to ask themselves deep questions. And as Jessica said, they need to talk to people other than computational linguists. Because you get into this kind of circular thing, you know, and all you know, all you, well, it's CNN, it's this, it's capsule, you know, and they're very happy talking about that endlessly and endlessly. But I, you know, they never stop to ask some of the more general questions about what it is, what it is that we're really trying to, to grasp in our computations. Yes, I would, I would even say sufficient. I mean, obviously, I'm out on a limb here. But uh, the, the point is, there are appropriate incongruities in jokes. And, but they're characterized in a special way. A joke has to be sudden. There has to be a, a turn on the dime. There has to be a sudden reconceptualization, or as Graham Ritchie calls it, a forced reinterpretation of the scripts in a joke. But as that thing I called the comic tale, there's also an appropriate incongruity in that too, but it's very diffuse. And anybody, the folklorists who know the Schwenka, you know, know that these stories are funny, people laugh at them, but they're not jokes. Very often the trick is revealed somewhere in the middle of the story. It doesn't come at the end. But these are still regarded as funny. And there are appropriate incongruities, but they're not surprising appropriate incongruities. So I still think that the, the, the formulation is key. If somebody would like to refine it, be my guest. If somebody is capable of operationalizing it, more power to you, uh, but I do think it's key. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, your joke about hating uh, the computational linguistics 
So, for instance, to me, uh, if I had to explain it, I would use uh, benign violation theory. Yeah, I w you can read my chapter on benign violation theory, <laughs> and I won't go through it here. But I, I do have a chapter in my last book on benign violation theory. But yeah, it's incongruous in the sense that, uh, you know, I say I don't hate computational linguists, and then I simply uh, indicate that. Oh, there are some that I hate, you know, as individuals, right? So that's a contradiction and incongruity. But it, it's kind of appropriate because, one, you know, one can hate a policeman without necessarily hating the police. One can hate a teacher without necessarily hating all teachers. So there is an appropriate, there is an appropriate, and then I say I don't hate them as a class, you know. So, so it's, a, it's a relationship between categories of, of class and class membership. No, I don't. <laughs> For me, to, to give you the quick answer, humor as appropriate incongruity is an intellectual process. It's not fundamentally an emotional mechanism. However, and this is, emotion accompanies the use of this intellectual thing. It can add to it. So as opposed to making fun of a linguist, I make fun of some politician that you're all against. That may enhance the joke for you, but it does not create the joke. <clears throat> Would you say the same thing for something more amorphous like, say, humor? Yes, I would. I, but, but as I said just a second ago, that when you're talking about humor more generally, well, you've got people who have analyzed you know, long texts, for example. I can spot one sitting toward the rear, who you know, finds that, of course, there's humor in long texts. And there are problems, because there are moments of humor throughout the text. And then there's also a, a kind of a, a, a more general sense of the thing when the thing comes to its conclusion. Uh, you know, it's uh, Northrop Fry felt that if everything turned out in the end and there was a wedding, it was a comedy, uh, you know, and not a tragedy. So these, these words do begin to, to glide into one another. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think what happens in, in many of these other situations is your, appro your appropriateness is not surprising. It's built into the structure of the narrative. And then we find, you know, and you might say to her, uh, you know, she really loved him from the beginning, which is why she was arguing so strongly with him and why she rejected him. And you come to certain, certain mechanisms that overcome the opposition. But they're not surprising very often, and they're not, they're not what we would call jokes. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>